Now that, that's what I'm talking about. Hey pals, welcome to a new video. I'm gonna address the first thing you've noticed first, uh, which is the hairstyle. So I'll give you five seconds to adjust to that. Okay, so welcome to the first in uh, what should be a series of Insignia devlogs. I won't do these every week, but whenever I've got a week where something interesting happens that uh, has relevance to pixel art or useful things in Unity for me to share, I will make a video out of it and um, chronicle it here. So this week I worked on a, an attack for Armin. It's, uh, it's a magic attack and it comes with um, some interesting movement options and um, implications to do with pixel shaders. There was a lot of dev and testing and prototyping going on. So I wanna share that with you. The primary thing in this, uh, I think, is the exploration of render textures and how they can be used uh, to isolate particle effects or any effects that you create in pixel art or otherwise in Unity, and then apply uh, shaders to them to do things like give them procedural outlines or any other kind of um, effects that you want in shader territory as a post-processing layer. So that's kind of what this is all about, um, using this attack as a, as a baseline. Now, the first thing with this attack was the design constraints. Uh, all of the magical abilities are designed to give Armin some kind of edge in combat. They're going to cost some meter to use, and they're going to be kind of like OP abilities that when you use them, you can use them to like get out of jail free or to create some really interesting combo opportunity or uh, do something that you otherwise wouldn't be able to do. And they should be able to synergize with each other. I've had a lot of difficulty working with these uh, over the last couple of years. In fact, as far as the design of the game has gone, these are the most challenging thing for me to design because they are bottlenecked by the enemy designs, the environment designs, and everything else that Armin can do. And all of those three things must uh, be developed in harmony for any of them to actually move forward. So, you know, an enemy design that doesn't take into account Armin's special abilities will undoubtedly miss any opportunities for Armin to, to use those, uh, those enemies or abuse those enemies' properties when using those abilities, right? Likewise, if there's some sort of environmental feature that I could be creating, if I'm not thinking about those abilities, then I might not design the environment for them. And all three of those uh, experience that. So it's been really difficult. And since 2019, I've been playing around with different iterations of, of different uh, abilities to really come up with the identity of Insignia as a, as a combat system and as, a, as an action game. So what I worked on this week was the second in a series of these abilities. It's a dash. It allows you to target an enemy on screen and if, essentially teleport to that enemy's position while creating a hitbox between your old position and the enemy's position and attacking anything uh, that lies in the path. This was fairly easy to implement. Uh, it's just an animated um, velocity you know, push from point A to point B. There's a little bit of ray casting going on just to make sure that there's a clear path to get to there. I did consider, and we spoke about using A star to create some sort of pathfinding exercise so that you couldn't teleport yourself into a closed space. You know, it had to be somewhere that you'd be able to get into. But I think in this game, it's just too difficult to distill all of the different movement options in order to actually definitively say, yes, Armin could get into this spot or no, he couldn't. Um, so I ended up going with a stock raycast for that. The next thing was to consider uh, how we were going to create the hitbox. So most of the abilities in the game are purely um, you know, directional and they face one direction, which is in front of the uh, user of those hitboxes and is defined by the sprite. But this ability could be used to go in any direction. So I needed to hack around a little bit with my hitbox uh, solution and create a hitbox, a custom hitbox that basically gets instantiated or um, enabled and reset whenever we do the attack. And there was a little bit of math involved in defining how long it should be and where it should be positioned such that it covers the entire space of Armin's position all the way to the enemy's position, plus a little bit, give or take, uh, and having that be something that you could trust would actually do damage to all the enemies around it when you do the attack. Beyond that, the greatest challenge, and I think what's most relevant in this video, 
is the visual representation of this. So in Insignia, there's a little bit of an interesting elemental um, model going on where rather than water, fire, earth, and air, I have space, time, energy, and entropy. I still like to flavor those four elements with the classical elements. So in this case, space is aligned with air or lightning. I wanted to create this idea where the trail or the, the hitbox was represented by a rip in space, kind of like a wormhole. Um, and there would be lightning surrounding that wormhole. And originally I thought of this as a kind of a cloud, you know, and I envisaged that I would use a particle system that would then be shaded in post uh, to create uh, the cloud volume. And I would have this constellation background that was parallaxed in that layer to make it look like what you're looking at is something that goes through to another dimension. So I mocked this up in a sprite and it was looking pretty good. Uh, I was convinced that the effect would look okay, um, but I wasn't sure how I was going to actually create it and, and make it work. So I got to work putting together a particle system in Unity and it wasn't really what I anticipated. Basically, the particle systems are quite volatile and because they are systems unto themselves, you, you don't really want them to be the same every time. Uh, and at the same time, you want them to be reliable. So using a particle system for a hitbox didn't really look like it was the right fit because if I wanted it to behave and actually, you know, fill the areas where the hitbox was going to be, then it, it looked very one note. And it was getting quite difficult to think about how I would stagger the animation and create flow as an animation um, to yeah, sell the effect the way that I wanted it to look in the, uh, in the prototype, in the preview. So I ended up scrapping that idea. The next idea was to create some kind of sprite. Uh, and at this point I had transitioned away. I'd had a night to sleep on it and I transitioned away from this idea of clouds because I thought I might look too gaseous. And instead I went for something more like fabric, something ripping, uh, because it's a more literal metaphor and it, it just makes things feel a little more, um, it's a bit more comprehensible, right? And it looks edgier. So I created this sprite. I was happy with the second iteration and I set to work trying to create a shader that would distort this sprite and allow me to position it in such a way that I could uh, apply those constraints that I had and meet those, meet those requirements. So um, it needed to be omnidirectional. It needed to be able to be stretched. And I experimented with a few different ways of how to do that, thinking about, okay, what if I tile the sprite? Um, how does that affect the shader? Unfortunately, it created a seam that was um, not very nice. You know, how do I create the tail and the top of the animation? So I wanted it to taper. Um, and I was doing things like masking out a kind of triangle at the very end to look like a taper. I also tried doing like a nine slice. So having the very beginning and the very end not tile and have everything else tile in the middle. And none of those seemed to work the way that I wanted them to. It was becoming clear that anytime I tried to make this procedural, it just wouldn't have the energy or the, the, the look that I really wanted to give it. And most of my game is, is very, it's, it's basically populated with hand-drawn animations. And so having something procedural in this space, uh, it needs to look hand-drawn or it won't fit. So what I settled on was actually having a series of hand-drawn animations that can uh, span each of the different relative and relevant lengths. So, you know, one that's a little bit shorter, one that's a little longer, one that's half the screen, most of the screen and full screen. And to basically animate those how I want them to, and then apply some post-processing shading uh, and a bit of, uh, bit of magic there to make them look like they were designed to be animated at the angles that they could be. Pixel art is notoriously bad at rotating on angles that aren't, you know, 90 degrees and 45 degrees. Anytime you get a little bit more slight, curves start looking really janky and you start getting things like um, basically aliasing that that is hard to resolve, right? It, the edges stand out really badly. So what I committed to doing was creating this procedural camera system. And the camera system basically takes a set of layers and these layers are a scriptable object that I created and each scriptable object represents one particle type, one effect type. That effect type goes into a list and that list 
is read by some kind of manager. The manager at runtime says, okay, we have three or four different particle types. I will therefore create three or four different cameras. And each of those cameras will be dedicated to looking at just that particle type. And the particles themselves or effects themselves will be given a script that layers them on the Z axis inside of the clipping planes of those cameras. So for every effect that we want to do that's different, we will have a different camera looking at that effect and the contents that will go into creating it. Once that's done and the cameras are isolated and looking at the effect, the output of those cameras is sent to a texture. We call that a render texture. The render texture can be a lower resolution or whatever resolution you want. Um, but in this case, keeping it at the native resolution of the game makes whatever is put into the camera filtered in a, in a pixel way. Then, because it's a texture, you can add a material to it and create any kind of shading that you want. And shading, if you're unfamiliar with it, basically means um, applying any kind of transformation to the contents of the image that the GPU will apply, such as moving pixels left and right, changing the colors of pixels, um, adding some kind of maths over the pixels so that they you know, adapt or, or change in any way. It's basically doing stuff to pixels. So I created my can animation and I put it in the game and gave it a simple outline test. And this was the result. I was really happy with how this turned out. And I thought, okay, what do we do next to make it look like the original concept? So the next thing was to add the space underneath. I thought for a while that I would be doing some kind of parallaxing in the shader to actually make it look like it's moving against the flow of the camera. And that's still possible, but it didn't really seem necessary as the uh, parallaxing of the actual camera versus the stationary uh, stars did create some kind of parallax effect anyway. So just adding those in and replacing the white of the effect was uh, enough to create a really nice, interesting star um, perspective. Beyond that, one of the most difficult things was justifying and defining an outline. So I want the effect to be visible at all times, but I don't want it to be jarring in any way or to take away from the contents inside of it, right? We want the fabric to be clear, but we want the outline to be clear as well because we want people to know uh, where the actual uh, bounds of the hitbox are, or at least a clarity that there is a hitbox there or some region there. So uh, the challenge here was picking a color that actually worked. I've said this before uh, in older videos, if you're going to give an outline to an object, it needs to contrast with the color on the inside of the object. So if your object is black, you need to give it a white outline or a light outline so that it stands out against uh, the inside and allows it to be seen on dark backgrounds, right? If your inside is dark and your background is dark, the white outline will help cl uh, clearly define the shape of that object. If you have a light background, then the dark uh, will already be contrasted and the outline won't be visible, but it doesn't matter because you'll see the effect coming through anyway. Your object will be visible nonetheless. The difficulty here was that in dark backgrounds, uh, we really do need something that's like white to show. So in a night sky, as you can see here, uh, it's really hard to see the fabric effect and it doesn't really look very visible at all. But in the daytime, the white takes away way too much from the black. So I had the idea to actually do some kind of blend modifier on this. And in order to do a blend, um, you need to know what's in the background. And shaders don't have any context on what's behind the uh, the image. So you need to pass in that somehow. What that required in this case was creating another camera that looks at the scene. So none of the UI, but just the raw environment and the character and things that are uh, visible in the game and giving that a render texture and sending that into the shader. And if you do that, then you can actually see what's on the camera and what's in the scene behind the shader without actually doing anything. Uh, extra. So simply passing that in and adding it beneath the effect allowed me to multiply it right around where that outline should be and actually brighten up the background. So if the background's dark, then the outline color will be a little bit brighter than that. And if the background is light, then the outline will still be a little bit brighter than that. So it makes it relative uh, instead of absolute. And this, I think, looked really, really good in the game. 
and allowed me to not have to worry about different backgrounds and different colors clashing with the effect itself. So if we have a red sky, the outline will be red, uh, but a brighter red than the background. In the end, this is where I left it. Uh, I still have a little bit of work to do on this. I'd like to add some lightning particle sprites uh, to give it a little bit more oomph and to add that air element affiliation in there as well. Uh, but for now, this was the week that I spent between the 15th and the 19th. Thank you so much for watching and I will catch you in the next one. Hey pal, thanks for watching. And thanks most especially to the patrons and Twitch subs who support this channel and my game dev project Insignia. To find out more, click the links in the description below. And uh, if you like this video, tell YouTube by clicking the like button and then YouTube will tell me and then I'll make more videos. That's nice. Thanks again, and uh, until next time.